Hello and welcome to Biblicia.com. I want to ask you a couple of questions today about joy or happiness in your life. Why is it in an age of such wealth where so many of us have so many things to do with family and friends and cars and motorcycles and vacations and hobbies and so much that so many people are depressed? Why are so many people killing themselves? Why are so many people depressed? You, you might understand it in a certain setting or in a certain place where uh, life is just hard or difficult, but in America? In the 21st century, with all the blessings that we've got, why are so many people so depressed? There are two passages that I want to look at as we begin this brief examination today, this brief talk today. Two passages. Let me take you to them. The first is in John chapter 17, verse 3, citing from the New American Standard Bible. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is Jesus himself talking about what eternal life is. The next passage is in 1 John. So the same author writes the Gospel of John and his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, in chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. This is John writing, The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And, this, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now, we all want to be happy. We, we can't help but want to be happy in life. I want that for you, viewer. For anybody watching this, if, this is, if you're somebody that I know that, has referred you to the, that I've referred you to this video, or you're a stranger here on the website or somewhere in social media land where this is played, I want you to be happy. And, and we'll look at that in this message today. Now, Christianity is not a message just about life enhancement. It's something more than that, as we'll see. But in many ways, Christian pastors, we are at work in the lives of our people for their joy. If you come to Jesus and it's just a misery fest alone, if there's not something more glorious in which you endure the miseries that will come, the difficulties that are guaranteed to come, then you're going to give up. You're going to show yourself to be unapproved even concerning the faith. That There's something set before us as believers in which we endure in Christ. So, so we, we suffer, we're called to it, but it's in light of a greater glory that's been set before us. We all want to be happy. Now, Christianity is not come to Jesus, give Him a shot, He'll give you health, He'll give you wealth, He'll give you prosperity, He'll make you look better, He'll make you feel better. He's not vitamins. He's not an exercise routine. The primary reason anyone watching this should ever really believe in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. God has borne witness concerning the Son in all of this. There was a crucifixion in the life of the Messiah, in the life of Jesus, that he endured, and we'll look at a passage on that from Hebrews here today, there's something he endured bearing witness to the judgment to come. When you die, you will stand before God in judgment. If you're in Christ at that judgment, it's a different kind of one. We won't get into all of it today, but there's no chance of condemnation for you. If you're not in Christ, you'll stand before a judgment in which there's no chance of salvation, and your punishment in hell will be meted out for you, and that's it. God is simply your enemy, simply your judge, simply your condemnation. Through His law, it will have its way with you. What Jesus does is deliver you from that judgment. That, that's the primary reason that I believe in Jesus. The real, of all the reasons I believe in Him, the primary one is that He's delivered me from that day. Martin Luther, I believe, is first coined saying the phrase, there are two days on my calendar, today and the day of judgment. 
And that, in many ways, is what this message is about and will reflect what I want to talk to you about today. Why people are so unhappy. But Christianity is not really about happiness. It's about the need for righteousness before a holy God and how you get it. It's through union with Jesus. Uh, but while it's primarily about the need of righteousness, therefore, and deliverance from judgment, how, if you knew you were delivered from judgment, if you knew you were secure that that day God will not impute your sin to you, how does that affect today? Joy is inevitable in the Christian life. As you reflect on what Christ has done for you, the covenant that you have with Him, with God, that you've been forgiven, you have peace with Him, Romans 5, 1 and 2. We've been justified by faith and peace with God is ours and we stand in it and then thus we look forward to the joy, the glory, the perfection that is to come that Christ merited for us. That, that's got effects today. Not, not just when I die, uh, into eternity, that's got effects that if you knew that, believed that, meditated on that, understood that from the Bible in your everyday, excuse me, life, in your marriage, in your workplace, in your hobbies, and all that you're doing, if it's all done under that reality, well, that changes everything. And again, not just for eternity, that changes your weekend. It changes this weekend. So, Christianity isn't about happiness, but happiness is a legitimate result of Christianity. And we understand this. Again, if we know these things, if we know what we've been delivered to and from, then in our lives, the struggles that we endure, this life that we're to have, that Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and me, Jesus said of himself, and then John bore witness to what Jesus said by saying, look, this is the life that God has given. This is the testimony of eternal life, and this life is in his Son. That's something John is living while he's writing that. That's something that he's living out in the first century in his life day to day. It's not just what is in the future. It is what is now experienced by John and should be by every believer. There is this passage in Hebrews 12 that I want to take you to now. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Look at, look at what uh, this writer says about Jesus himself. That he, uh, he the writer in Hebrews uh, here advises us to look to Jesus, who is the, uh, the originator and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All that Christ endured, this 30 years of life that he lived in preparation for the cross, earning by being one born under the law, born of the virgin, but a descendant of David through Mary, uh, uh, even through Joseph. They're both of the tribes in Israel, and Mary and Joseph, and his adopted father, Joseph. Jesus is the seed of David through Nathan, through Abraham, back to Adam. He is, and therefore, having lived and never sinned, according to the law, and never broke any of the 613 commandments in the Torah, Jesus merits by virtue of his humiliation, being God eternal, he suffers, lives his life, suffers a perfect death. He never sinned. Death has no claim to him. He thus yields his spirit up in death, takes his life back, ascends into heaven, seated at the right hand, as it says here at the end of the verse, the right hand of the throne of God. That's where he presently is right now today. For that joy that was set before him in the triune plan, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the joy set before him to, to ransom sinners like you and me, he endured the cross, despising the shame of it, and is where he is today. So even in Christ, we see this model of endurance in things this, uh, that he endured for the joy set before him. And as Christians, we have a similar thing. We have a joy set before us of knowing God, seeing him face to face, Matthew 5, 8, the great promise of those who will inherit heaven uh, when they die. We have this set before us. That changes everything and allows us to endure today. We, we want to be happy. So why are so many people so miserable? It's because they're not headed to that inheritance. And so for them to be happy today is insanity. It would be insanity. Now, sin 
promises happiness. Sin promises happiness, and often, in the very short term, it delivers it. And, we're, we, you know, certain sins come to mind. Not all sin brings the kind of joy or, or happiness to people that some sins do, but sin promises what it never delivers in its fullness. It promises happiness and, and a good time, but it destroys. And, of course, destroys eternally if it's not forgiven. All sin will destroy eternally. It comes with a cost. Now, I'm a chaplain in the military. I'm an active duty guy. Been in almost 24 years, going on 24 years now. And so I see sadness in people's lives in a specific context, but I know that's just a microcosm of the life of many people. And I speak specifically thinking of Americans or those living in the advanced world with all the blessings of indoor plumbing and post-it notes and everything that we've got. I mean, it's just incredible what we've got and all these blessings. So. Why are there 14 suicides on my installation where I currently live this year? We had 10 last year. There's almost twice that many, roughly, uh, of attempts, and they just don't die. Why are so many people doing this? Why are they miserable? Why are they sad? Why are they putting guns to their heads? It's not a problem just in the military. It's a, a problem in the culture, in the world. And I'm thinking about this. Now, I see it in my mind in a certain way, but we are so wealthy. We, we are so blessed. I mean, we can Netflix and chill. I canceled Netflix due to cuties, but I mean, we can watch whatever we want to watch and, and on Apple TVs and whatever. Uh, we have so much and, and, and at our disposal, so many things. We eat so well. We uh, live healthy. Again, the blessings of the harnessing of fire with electricity and air conditioning and all of our domestication. Why are so many so unhappy? It's because their sin's not forgiven and they should be unhappy. If you were going to jail, today's a Saturday, if you were going to jail on Monday, a horrible prison, for the rest of your life, you were going to be incarcerated in that place, how good of a time could you really have this weekend? I mean, you might get some money and say, I'm going to go spend it all, I'm going to have my time, I'm going to go do my thing, but how happy could you really be headed to a horrible prison for the rest of your life? if you were given some reprieve and a weekend to enjoy before you went and did it, how, how happy could you be? Well, my, my point, my, my reason for stating this is you would not be happy at all. You could not be. Many people today are walking around ignoring the words of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords Jesus, who said, when you die, you will stand before me in judgment. There's an impending death for them. They will be judged and condemned for their unrepentant, unforgiven sin. And God will say, into hell you go where you want for eternity. They're living under that reality as if it's not true today. So on their calendar is not the day of judgment, hence the reason for Jesus, really no different than the reason for any false god that they might believe in. I'm happy. I'm doing okay. There's a temporary distraction for many of us. And many of those people committing suicide are focusing on the things of reality and the misery and sort of the dread of life. They're kind of undistracted for a little bit. But if you understood the reality, if you are not a Christian watching this and you understood what I understand, you may not believe in these spiritual forces that are against you, the world, the flesh, the devil. You may not. I do. I do understand them. You may not have any capacity to understand them. I do. Because I have been brought into covenant with God and He's opened my eyes. If you understood what Jesus was saying is waiting for you, depression, sadness, suicide would be your only logical options. You would be miserable. And you should be. So while Christianity is a promise of deliverance from these things, and thus joy ensues, someone not delivered from these things, if you were aware of them, who would be having a great time in life? So depression, I want that for people that are condemned. I want it because maybe you'll wake up. Maybe through it, God could say something. He can shout in your pain and bring something of wisdom to your life. So while I wouldn't want anybody unhappy, I don't care who you are. I really don't want it. And ultimately, for eternity, I want just your happiness. 
I know it will not come except through Jesus Christ. And so if you're outside of his grace, his shed blood has not washed you of your sin. You don't believe in his resurrection and thus called on him to save you from that day to come. You are of all men to be pitied, of all women to be pitied. I am miserable for you. And I walk around and I see why some people kind of wake up to this and they're so depressed in their life and they should be. Now I'm going to present them the option of the gospel and I'm going to say, I don't know anything. I don't need to know anything other than Christ crucified. I will preach him to, to sinners that if you cling to him and if you trust in him, We'll see His promise for you that will deliver you from depression and misery the more you come to understand how sure it is and God is at work in your life. That's what we want for you. But depression is an aid for people then. There's only one God and life without Him is not worth living. There's only one God and life without Him is simply not worth the living. I, I, when I first got married, my wife and I looked at my, this was before the advent of digital photography, and you had to take pictures and go get them developed and, and go pick them up, and it was always this few day waiting period, and you were excited to see how your pictures came out. Sometimes they were horrible, sometimes they were good, but this was, uh, you know, not quite the Polaroid age, but you still had, when I was growing up, you had to take the pictures and then bring them to like a Walgreens or something to get developed. I know, it's ancient, I know. But when we got married, my wife looked at all these pictures that I'd taken. I had very few from my youth. My parents, I was the third son, so you know, the first kid and got pictures probably every other day of his life. You do a flip book and watch him age. With me, it was like he was born, there he is in middle school, a couple of photos, and then high school, and that was it. And you'd see like aging 18 years. I was the third kid, and again, they had to pay for all this. So I didn't have hardly any pictures. But I promised myself as I got a little older and left home at 19, 18 years old, I left uh, where I was from, I haven't been back since, that I would take pictures of things and I'd remember things. So I had all these dumb pictures. I had pictures of trees, I had pictures of hallways, uh, buildings, uh, uh, sunsets, uh, you name it. I'm just seeing them in my mind. Pictures of like a bird in the middle of a field, you know, near a bench. And I thought, I guess, at that time that, you know, years later when I looked at those photos, they would mean something to me. But they really didn't. And my wife was like, what is this? And I'd look at it and I'd say, I think that was Wichita Falls, Texas? I, no. No, that kind of looks like San Antonio. I don't know what that is. We ended up throwing away two large, uh, like, hefty trash bags worth of photographs. We kept some, but most of them, it just didn't mean anything anymore. You know, some of them were, you know, certain amounts of years old. Others might have been a little more recent, but they didn't mean anything. But the ones that did, I noticed they had people in them. There were some of the places, sure, but the most meaningful photos were the ones with my friends in them, family in them. Those were the ones that endured. And I want to tell you that this life is like, imagine a picture of the playground you grew up on. And hopefully you can remember one. I can. Seaborn Elementary School, Mineral Ridge, Ohio. I remember the playground that I grew up on. I don't know what yours looked like, but, you know, I remember this one. And imagine if you had like a picture of it. You know, that playground. That's cool. You know, having that photo of where you grew up, uh, you know, that's cool to have. But how much cooler would one be with you and your best friend on the playground. How much more would that photo be worth than an empty one? I wrote a letter on this and I'll put a link to it in the description. It's called Joy. It was my attempt at photography, or photography, excuse me, my attempt at poetry. It was my attempt at poetry. I'll put a link to it below. Um, it's called Joy. And I just say that life without life's creator is meaningless. It's like an empty playground. It doesn't mean anything. And there's only one way to know the only true God, and that is through Jesus. If you say otherwise, you've made God a liar. We saw that in 1 John in the initial verses we looked at at the start of this video. So, of course, anyone that wants to say God is a liar is going to walk around his universe miserable in this world. Now, you got good air conditioning, as Ray Comfort says. you got good lighting. It's warm. It's beautiful. I took a ride this morning with my son. We were enjoying the open air. Uh, you can walk around. But if you're not in Christ, this is a big jail cell, and you're just waiting for sentencing, and then you're going to prison for eternity. That's a threat from God, and He's not playing. In your sin, He's going to kill you, unless you repent. 
unless you believe in what Christ did, cleansing even the universe of your sin and my sin and Adam's sin and takes you out of a dead humanity into himself, you're going to die. God should be first in our lives, and if he's not, of course it's meaningless and miserable, and you become like a modern Sisyphus just rolling the boulder up the hill to watch it roll down again. That's miserable, and I don't care if you're making six figures doing it or two, you're going to be miserable, and I don't want that for anybody, but it's natural. It's the outworking. It's reasonable for me to say, if you're condemned, you're just waiting on prison Monday morning, of course you should be miserable. And maybe that'll be an aid to you to think about how meaningless things are without Christ. There's only one way to know God, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. That is it. There is the law that shows us our sin. That's its point. You look at the Ten Commandments, you're a Gentile, you can get this no matter where you're from. You look at the Ten Commandments, lying and stealing and blasphemy and adultery and covetousness and disrespect of parents and ugh, all of the sin. It shows you you've got a sinful heart. Your conscience bears witness. You know what sin is. The gospel then comes in and says, okay, if God has revealed to you your sinfulness, is he's going to judge you for your sin nature, your sinfulness. Here is the option. Settle out of court today. Repent of your sin. Acknowledge it. Turn from it. Put your trust in Jesus. Call on him to save you from the judgment you deserve. The law works to bring you to the gospel. It can bring you no further. The gospel takes us the rest of the way with God. Look at this passage with me in uh, 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians, yep, chapter 5, 19 to 21. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. That's what we need, viewer. And he is committed to us, that's Christians, the word of reconciliation. Therefore, that's why we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. That's what I'm doing right now in this video. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He, the Father, made Him, the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin in our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That is what we need. Righteousness, as we said, that's the thing Christ died to bring you. And the knowledge of that righteousness permeates our everyday lives and brings us joy in the here and now, even a joy to endure the sufferings on the way to glory with Christ if necessary. So if you're in rebellion against Christ, you can't have this joy. And I don't want you to have a fake joy that distracts you from the reality of the judgment to come. I don't want you to have that. That distraction, I hate. So, if you're an NFL fan on your way to hell, and you're not considering your sin, the law, and the judgment to come because the Browns are playing this weekend, then I hate the NFL in your life. Because you're going to have a good time with some chips and dip, and you're not going to think about judgment, and so I hate that thing. But if God was first, not only, right, but if God is first where he belongs to be, who gives us all things richly to enjoy and gives us, uh, you know, marriage and children and good weather uh, and the bad weather to appreciate the good weather and whatever else, and he's first, all these other things become blessings. And, and you just thank God for being in the 21st century, maybe, as opposed to the 8th century. Even on the 8th century, they didn't have air conditioning and you can't miss what you never had and it's all good. So God's first, he's not alone. We're not to necessarily go out into a cave and sit and say, okay, God, just you. If you want to do that, okay, so, you, know, let's, you can write in. But if he's first, then these things aren't distractions. The NFL is not a distraction, necessarily. It can be a blessing. But I hate it if it's a distraction. Anything would be the same. I'm just using the NFL. If you're a hockey fan, you know, whatever. Uh, same thing. So, those walking around trying to ignore the reality of God's judgment are insane. This is why Jesus' freedom alone is the only real source of joy. And some will talk about a difference between happiness and joy. I understand that. But the joy I want for you is eternal, but it, it, it begins even today. Imagine if you knew that that judgment I'm talking about, when you die... 
It's been appointed unto you once to die, then comes judgment. Imagine if that judgment for you was one of reward with God, one where your father is, is calling the angels and the saints to witness your service and love to him and to others in your life. And you knew, like I recording this video, know that's my future. I know it. God has shown me it for 20 years. I know it. It's not boasting. I boast in the Lord. It's not boasting in me. I know that's my future. Imagine if this was true of you as it is of me or any Christian. Verse 24 of John chapter 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has, notice, now, presently, has eternal life and, look to the future, does not come into judgment, but has passed, again, past tense, out of death into life. If that's true of you, any Christian, that reality, just, just backtrack to today. You know, when we're doing ruck marches in the army and you're on a 12 mile ruck march and you got to do it in three hours and your blisters on your feet are, are barking at you and you got your weapon and your Kevlar's on and you got the rucksack on and it's just sucking, man, and you are just sucking. But you look up and you see the finish line, you go, ha ha ha, yeah, 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 here we go, let's finish it out. That is what we see here. In my life today, I've endured such persecution from the world, but I know I've already passed from death to life. On that day, I won't come into judgment. This reality of deliverance that I have righteousness, I share Jesus' perfect righteousness. It is my hope. I, I'm clothed in it like a, like a righteous flannel. It covers me from my sin. That's His covenant with me. Repent, trust in me, you get my righteousness. I reconcile you. This brings the life that John testified of in 1 John that we read at the outset. This is what Jesus said in John 5 here about being delivered. This is the passage that we see where Jesus said this is eternal life. It begins now to those who believe the good news. Christ died, rose again from the dead. They call on Him to be saved. This is their future. This is their present. And even in Jesus' life we see, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. We have a similar call to war with our sin, to grow in grace, to be in fellowship, and to bring this gospel to the world. It's what we do, man. It's what we're called to do. And this is what we want. It changes everything. In hell, God says there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I want you free. So repent and believe the good news. We Christians are in the joy business. Final passage for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 to 24. In this confidence, I intended, Paul's writing this, to, at first to come to you so that you might receive so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you, and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea, to Judea mm -hmm. plus tax. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what I decide, do I decide according to the flesh, so that with me there will be yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? That's a question. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Paul's not vacillating, neither is God. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but has been yes in Him, that is in God, verse 20, for as many as the promises of God are in Him, that's Jesus, they are yes. So, so you got to know the promises of God to know how in Jesus to you they are a yes. Okay, but here back to the middle of verse 20. Therefore, through him also is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who, all, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Notice, Paul knows what's coming, but he has the Spirit now in his heart as a pledge an earnest, a down payment. This is the life that John also knew that said, this is what he gives. This is the life that we live in the Son. We have life. This is the, John had the same regenerate, born again spirit within him that Paul had and speaks to these in Corinth about bringing to them in his ministry. 
Verse 23, but I call God as a witness to my soul that it was to spare you that I did not come again to Corinth. Not that we domineer over your faith, but notice this, friends, we are workers with you for your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. Paul said, we are workers with you for your joy. So, so we have to war sometimes just to believe the good news. We have to war against our sin all the time as believers. The whole of our life is repentance. But when Christ is first, when God is first, it's our life, it's our breath, it's our duty, it's what we do, and it's okay. We will endure. We will be blessed in doing it. And that is what I want for you. Repent. Believe the good news. If you're not in Christ, let me wake you up to the reality of this king who said to you, this is your future. You will be judged by God. It's not going to be good. I want to remind you of that to maybe wake you up. Look at the Ten Commandments and ask yourself if God is good and He judges you by them on that day when you die, ask yourself how bad you're going to do. And if the law has its way with you, it'll kill you. It'll take away your hope. It'll strip you of it and it'll rip it out of your self-righteous hands. And then the purpose of the law in your life, if God is calling you, will be to, uh, to take the law that presently stands as your condemnation and it'll walk behind the cross into the bleachers and begin singing as a chorus to the grace of God that's been poured out in your life through the love, reconciling work of Jesus Christ on that cross. Not for good people, but for sinners like us. It is good news. It's so good. Let that news permeate your every day, looking into eternity, knowing you will not come into judgment for your sin, but you are the blessed man, the blessed woman in view in Romans 4, 7 to 8. We didn't look at it here today, but that can be you, justified by faith, peace with God, righteousness yours as a gift of His grace. Repent and believe the good news. This is the righteousness that Christ comes to bring into our lives. It delivers from death.